Good morning, everyone. We Once again, we're in a new week, March 15th. This is the day that I feel daylight savings time more. That's next day for me. It's not the first day. It's the following day. So this will be attached to my hand, I think, all day long. But um, we give thanks to God as we do, as we make a habit of doing, so we remind ourselves to be thankful to God. And we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Praise to the blessed and holy Trinity, one God who gives us life, salvation, and resurrection. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship and praise. Be still and know that I am God. A lot adapting, right? Are we continuing our learning to walk in the dark by Barbara Brown Taylor in our chapter on the dark night of the soul? Got a little bit into some of the, the changes in the church. And um, so we're going to get a little bit more into that in the whether the church is in crisis in this generation or, or not. Um, church, a lot of people say the church is dying. Um, what does that really mean? And um, yeah, let's dig in a little bit. Religious scholars register this shift as a tip of the major iceberg. Karen Armstrong says that we are living through a time of global transformation when religious religions around the world are taking stock of what enmity has cost them and turning towards some new wisdom about what it means to be fully human. Phyllis Tickle says, that we are in the midst of a great rummage sale that the Christian church holds from time to time. Every age has its own accumulation to deal with, along with its own reasons for deciding what stays and what goes. Is substitutionary atonement still useful? How about salvation by faith in Christ alone? Do we really need professional clergy? What are those about those 19th century hymns? Through it all, the timing remains pretty predictable. If Tickle's terms, in Tickle's terms, what many of us are taking, talking part, taking part in, willingly or not, is Christianity's semi-millennial rummage sale of ideas. The last one was called the Protestant Reformation. No one knows about what to call this one yet. In his book, The Future of Faith, Harvey Cox says that the age of belief ended in 2005 when the New European Union declined to mention Christian anywhere in its constitution. People have voted with their feet. Doctrines and creeds are no longer enough to keep faith alive. Instead, the faithful seek practical guidance and direct experience from of the sacred. The new age we are living in is the age of the spirit, Cox says, already well underway in the global south. If this is a liberating moment for some people of faith, is it a moment of it is a moment of profound loss for others? Maybe you do not get one without the other, but age makes a difference. If I were 25 years old, just beginning to find my place in the great emergence, my excitement level would be higher than it is at 60, when it seems likely that I will not live long enough to see what emerges. At my age, I am supposed to be invested in bonds, not stocks. There is not enough time left to plant trees that will that take a long time to grow. Recently, I picked up, a, up the 35th printing of a book that was published in 1981, James Fowler's Stages of Faith. It was required reading in seminary, for hers at least, not mine. And though a lot 
of things have happened to change the world since then. The AIDS epidemic, the World Wide Web, 9-11, follower stages still sound familiar. The fantasy filled in that imitative faith of early childhood, followed by a more li literal faith of ch school children, then the conventional faith of adolescence largely inherited follows, followed by the individual faith of young adulthood. Plenty of people stop there, he says, while others go on to stages he finds harder and harder to describe. At the fifth stage, which Fowler says is unusual before midlife, people know the sacrament of defeat. They live with the consequences of choices they cannot unchoose. They have been permanently shaped by commitments they cannot unmake. Yet there is still a lot of undoing at this stage as people let go of many of the certainties about themselves and the world that they earlier worked so hard to put in place. The boundaries of the tribe no longer hold, strangers and strange truths are no longer frightening, but compelling paradoxical truths are the most compelling of all. With the gravitas that arrives when life is more than half over, people at this stage are ready to spend and to be spent emptying their pockets in one last ditch effort to make meaning. Earlier, I, de I declined to define my terms, but Fowler does a good job of defining his. Religion, faith, and belief are not the same thing, he says, though we often speak of them as if they were. In the 16th century, to believe meant to set the heart upon or to let the heart, to give the heart to, as in, I believe in love. But in the centuries following the Enlightenment, secular use of the word belief and believe began to change until they said less about the dis disposition of one's heart than about the furniture of, in one's mind. By the 19th century, when knowledge about almost anything consistently chiefly, consisted chiefly in empirical facts, belief became the opposite of knowledge. A person's belief in God was reduced to his or her belief system, the unprovable statements of faith that judge, the person judged to be true. The great pity of this conflation Fowler says is that when faith is reduced to belief in creeds and doctrines, plenty of thoughtful people are going to decide that they no longer have faith. They might hang on it if they heard the words used to describe trust or loyalty in something far beyond self. But when they hear faith used to signify belief in a set formula of theological truths, the light in their light eyes go out. Read maybe one more paragraph. When I listen to college students talk about faith, beliefs are what interest them most. Do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that only Christians go to heaven? No one asks, on what is your heart set? No one asks, what powers do you most rely on? What is the hope that gives meaning to your life? Those are questions of faith, not belief. The answers to them are not written down in any book. And we have a way of and they have a way of shifting in the dark. If you have understood, then what you have understood is not God, St. Augustine said in the fourth century. 1600 years later, the Northern Irish theologian Peter Rollins says the same thing with equal force. God is an event, he says, not a fact to be grasped, but an incoming to be undergone. So we'll stop there. And this is getting in a little bit technical on this little section here um, and kind of opening up a whole ball of wax. There is a reality when you look at the Re Protestant Reformation and now that the window dressings of faith, um, of our faith life sometimes take on greater significance in people's lives than the actual substance of faith. We, um, in Luther's time, it was what he called the adiaphora, the fancy, fancy word of, of the, the things that really don't have meaning, but are there. And they can be occasional for different cultures or settings or languages or times, but they, they can come and go, they can change. Um, and they, are the, they can be at the best, the vehicles of having the gospel come to us. At worst, they can bog us down in um, minutia, in details, in um, smells and bells, in um, ethical codes, in, in um, the right way to do things. And then we lose the track of it. 
I, I'm one that I, I love the rhythm of our ancient liturgy. It has actually survived more than just, you know, the 500 years since the Reformation. Some of our liturgies are predate Christ. They, they've endured. And I think they've endured because they are based in biblical witness. They're based um, in the early Christian and throughout the centuries, Christian worship and gathering, they, they've been kind of boiled down um, to just give Christ and give Christ for us. The holy, holy, holy um, that we do for our communion, um, another, uh, the Lord's Prayer, some of those, um, the confession that we do and those movements through our worship service are an ancient way of, of getting us also from coming in to being cared for and then being sent out. And there's an important rhythm in that. But does that mean you're not a church if you don't do it in that way? No. What is the essential pieces of church? Is Are you preaching Christ crucified for and risen for you? And applying that. So we, we do and... Um, we have the Apostles' Creed to round us in, and the, and right now we're doing a creedal song, which, you know, it's a different way to do it for a little season, about what we believe, because we do have a tendency as humans to put our faith in things that are not, um, are not the central thing. And the creed also contains some mystery. And some of the things that she's saying, you know, like, do we believe in atonement that God, um, substitutionary atonement, or that God has um, given that happy exchange for us, that Christ died on the cross so that we might live, and then also the, the um, salvation by faith in Christ alone. Is it just all these different pathways up the same mountain, and they're all good and right? Well, Christianity says no to that. There aren't different paths. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the only way. So we, as Christians, are um, by nature, kind of in the face of that. But I do think we, the trappings of all that a church must do, we do sometimes miss the point of what we really are as a church. The other things can be good things that we do as a community, but are we gathering in God's word? Are we receiving the grace of God as free and true gift? And so often that's not happening in churches anymore, or we're, we're confusing loving neighbor and championing change in the world with Christ's kingdom coming and being with us. There is definitely a rumble and a change is happening. And I might not be a 60 year old person or older, I'm, but I find myself making sure we're not throwing the baby Christ out with the bath, bath water. And I think that sometimes happen, happens. And Christianity also is meant to be offensive at times. It says everything that you think is right and good um, because you enjoy it isn't necessarily right and good. Um, sometimes it's sinful. And we can't always fix everything ourselves. Many times we can't those chasms we talked about on Sunday. We need Christ. So as far as religion and belief and faith, um, if we go at the, the logic, if we go at the, the details, if we try to resolve the mystery, or if we try to explain how the Holy Spirit creates faith, it's not something we create in ourselves. it's given to us from the outside. It defies reason sometimes. Um, are we missing the point completely? So we'll, we'll continue kind of running with this. Um, this is a very popular belief right now. Um, but like I said, some things have endured more than 500 years. And we'll see where the dust shut settles. But I also know that Christ guarantees the church, not us. And he never said the church is going to have it. Um, well, while we want others to have this word, True church is one where, where this is preached purely and truly for you. 
So I think a lot of us are, are struggling with family members that aren't part of church, grandchildren that aren't baptized, um, neighbors that don't believe. We've talked about that here. Um, and I, we shouldn't be comfortable with that. And we do know the church has harmed people throughout the centuries. Every religion has harmed people and that, that does create suspicion and anger and angst. We are in a place of division in so many different ways in our, in our world. Once again, I think that is cyclical to the divisions. And I pray and I hope that God um, will continue to unite us in Christ and our need for an external word, not just echo chambers of our own desires, our own thoughts, but that word from outside that comes and consoles when nothing else can, comes and convicts when we don't want to be, comes and gives grace. Um, that's that experience of, of the word of the divine that um, at its best our church is doing. At our worst, we forget that that's the most important part. But God is faithful when we are not. Be still and know that I am God. You have been born anew through the living and abiding word of God. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by the Son. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn, bringing the glory of our risen Lord who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the sustaining goodness of your creation. We give thanks for the times where we can look at our faith once again, our practice of religion, what brings us together and what has created obstacles rather than vehicles of encounters with your word, receiving of your gift of faith and grace. Help us to discern what, what are the central things and what are the things that can change and to be wise in our care for our community and also trust that you are the head of the church. You are the one that creates the church through your word. And as we marvel that we have continued to be together during a pandemic, may we also see that you're at work in other ways that we can't see. Help us to wrestle with what it means to be faithful, what it means to believe, and to, to have that trust as a gift from you that all will be well. And well doesn't mean perfect God, but well means in your hands. Give us that faith, Lord. For the new creation in Christ and all gifts of healing and forgiveness, we pray. We pray for those in need of your care and healing this day. Those who are struggling, those who are lost, those who are broken and scared. And those who are needing in need of healing, may you bring your gifts of healing and the forgiveness of our sin to the hearts and the minds and the bodies that need it most to this day. For the gift of relationship with others, we rejoice and we ask you to continue to connect us. And also, Lord, we also pray for this, for the communion of faith in your church, that we are connected by faith, which is your gift to us. In our relationships, may we share that faith and trust that you will create newness and connection and support us in our relationships through that faith. Merciful God of might, Renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children, and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for those who govern nations of the world. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for our branches of government. We pray for our governors and mayors and county officials. 
and state legislative bodies and all of those leaders in our country and all those leaders in other countries as well. May you lead us forward to be whole, to be provided for, to be out of many one. For we pray for countries ravaged by strife or warfare. We especially lift up Miramar today and some of the horror we are hearing out of that country and Ethiopia as well. And other places we're not even aware of, Lord, where people are living in terror and in fear and lacking basic security and basic needs. We pray, of course, for this ongoing pandemic and these, this next, whatever this next is, and trust that you are with us as you have been. For all who work for peace and international harmony, we pray, Lord, the fragileness of peace, the hypocrisy that sometimes, many times, is active in our world. May we be aware of our words, be aware of our actions, be aware of our reaction to one another and why our bias and as I see this picture, God, I also give thanks for the snow that's falling in my backyard right now. The changes of season in this time of year. For all who strive to save the earth from carelessness and destruction, we thank you, Lord. And for the Church of Jesus Christ in every land, as we struggle today and name today the exodus from church in some places, but yet the growth of church in others, like Tanzania, what is happening there, Lord? What is your spirit up to there? What is your spirit up to here? Give us a peak, Lord, give us that hope that we need, um, that you are continuing to be present with your church, your children throughout your creation. O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us this day. Amen.